Kavin, thanks so much for taking the time out today and joining us here. Um, these are obviously very difficult times, and uh, you recently announced a slew of measures for the well-being of your staff, including unlimited paid leaves for those suffering from COVID or caring for infected members within their families. I'd like you to talk about these initiatives briefly and how the management arrived at these decisions. Sure. Um, always good to catch up, and thanks for having me. You know, in the in the last couple of months, we wanted to get ahead of the curve as quickly as possible, and We've been doing small measures leading up to you know, some big ones that we'll talk about. You know, in, in sort of March, April itself, we had just make sure that um, uh, the team had sort of the, their health top of mind. And we, we sort of launched something called the hike supplement kit, which would you know, reimburse people for all the basic supplements that would act as prophylactics to any sort of, you know, illness that, that would be there. So vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, turmeric, all that stuff that we wanted to ensure that people just had it at the top of mind and that, um, you know, we would reimburse. We also started announcing extra COVID support um, in sort of uh, late April, early May to ensure that we have a pretty strong insurance coverage for the team, but there are always cases, you know, in, in situations like this that go way beyond sort of the insurance coverage. And we wanted to know that the, we wanted to make sure the team and people knew that we got them covered completely uh, in situations like this, because it was not just about the expenses. It's all about, it's also about organizing all this stuff, which has been a nightmare, especially in cities like Delhi and also flexible time off. I think that was the, the obvious one that we just, you know, told our managers and, and decided as an executive team to do quickly because these are such unforeseen circumstances and people are dealing with so much stuff that it's totally fine if people need to take time off and whatever that may be. And um, recently we just started the vaccination drive this week uh, and also organized uh, home testing for people in partnership with a couple of labs to ensure that people can get sort of COVID tests done in the, the comfort of their homes because people don't want to you know, go out and get exposed. And, um, you know, even during the first wave, we were very proactive and we implemented remote working and Hike actually has become remote first since, you know, Feb, March, 2020, it's actually been over a year. We've just been remote first now. And uh, we did a lot of stuff proactively before as well. And so, you know, our goal approach to everything is we're good at solving problems, but the key thing is to ensure that we get ahead of the curve and be proactive and do whatever little measures to get the ball rolling. And as we learn more, keep responding and keep sort of problem solving uh, as we go along and, Look, you know, business at the end of the day is it's people. If our people are at risk, then the business also is at risk. So from that standpoint as well, it's very, very important that we, you know, ensure that our people know we have their backs. And um, yeah, I think that's uh, what we've done so far. It, it's really amazing that you're doing all of this. And uh, of course, a, a lot of folks out there are also sort of extending every help that they can. So kudos to the ecosystem for that. But Kavin, it's always a tough ask to balance growth slash output and employees well-being at, at Hike. How are you uh, finding that balance? It's tough, but it's not impossible. And I find that the best companies for always find a way to do both. And, you know, I, I've always run Hike, well, at least last three, four years in a five-point framework which is, you know, vision, principles, people, product, process. And we have to have a vision for the company where we're headed, where the dream state is, what the world looks like. We want to have a set of principles, our values through which we'll, you know, use to chase after that vision. Based on those values, we'll hire people who have the shared values and principles. And then with those people, we'll build some fantastic products. And can we have just enough process to streamline all of the above? And when you bring so much clarity to people, then you tend to have the right people in the right culture. And at the end of the day, a company is just set of people, a set of people gathered together, a community. And when times get tough, like you know, now we're uh, times like today, we can fall back on this strong culture in a very big way. Because the culture is more like a community of people, more than like a, you know, your old school ancient company. <laughs> And uh, on top of that, just be incredibly proactive, you know, work with our managers and over communicate to ensure we're covering all our bases. And uh, this is also how we're usually the first to do stuff, um, you know, when, when times get tough, because you just got to let your, let your people know that, we, that the company has their back. And, um, and so once you realize that again, that, you know, the business output is, is, is so tight to uh, people being productive and people being productive is tight to people first and foremost being safe and well, 
then you want to solve that as quickly as possible um, as a company. Right. There's uh, clearly a lot of empathy coming through in, in you know, what you're saying and what you're doing. Um, I want you to talk about the need for empathetic leadership at a time like this and you know, how leaders can be equipped for situations like this, especially when most of them haven't ever faced a crisis like this before. And also, Kavin, if you um, could, you know, sort of touch upon, which you already have a little bit, the need to rethink workplaces and, you know, put people first. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, um, I honestly think we're going to have stronger leaders emerge out of the situation because I think setbacks will always make you stronger. And, uh, you know, for, for your first point, I think it's not as much about empathetic leadership. I feel like just great leaders tend to be empathetic. And that's one of the reasons why people follow great leaders. They have a way of bringing out the best, you know, bringing the best people together and also building an environment that gets the best out of them, especially in difficult times. I think that's when the, I mean, that's the test of great leadership. Um, second, I think you, you asked about how leaders can be equipped for situations like this. You know, I think first and foremost is just how do you bring clarity to the situation as quickly as possible? And the one thing that I, you know, discussed with my executive team very quickly was guys, our business can, needs to continue growing, but we're not going to be able to do that with other people. So we have to do whatever it takes to make sure our people are safe and well, and be as proactive as possible to get ahead of the curve so that also the impact of the business is as low as possible. So we are incentivized to be as proactive, put the extra effort in to ensure the impact of the business also is low. Second is just, we have to over communicate in times like this with, with the situation changing so dramatically, not even every day, every couple of hours, we have to over communicate and open up channels so that tough news can spread fast. You know, it's very easy for good news to spread fast, <laughs> but it's very tough for bad news to spread fast. And we have to build channels so that bad news can spread fast as well so we know the problems that are coming our way. Third, ideally, you built a culture that's very good at problem solving. I think that's very, very important. Our culture is like that. And you can throw any problem at this culture today. We'll, we'll go solve it. And fourth is, honestly treat everything you're doing, even in a situation like this, as a hypothesis. So if a problem comes your way, we have a hypothesis on how to go solve it. Let's get attached to solving the problem, not to the first solution that we have move fast, learn along the way, and make modifications to the approach. It's honestly how we build products at Hike as well. It's the same mentality. <laughs> um, number three, uh, you asked about workplaces and do we need to rethink workplaces? I think so. And honestly, this is the one of the best things that's happened. The big positive takeaway is COVID's really pushed uh, a lot of companies to think about remote first. And it's forced uh, fancy offices out of the equation of building a fantastic culture which I think is fantastic. And um, I th what we've seen is remote, a remote first approach and Hike is a remote first company now. It, it pushes a bigger focus on productivity and streamlining information because these, frust these frustrations, lack of productivity, lack of access to information, no clarity, these frustrations are so magnified remotely because you're not in person. You can't just grab people and, and sort of figure out what to do. And so building systems to ensure that we have a tremendous amount of communication, tremendous amount of transparency is so important when you're sort of remote first. And, you know, if you look at Hike, we're operating remotely have been from 50 plus cities <laughs> and maybe a couple of different time zones, by the way. And so, and we've managed that fairly well. And we can tell you that this is here to stay. Hike is a remote first company. And we're also complementing our remote first approach with spaces in the offline world, because we feel that especially for new employees, chemistry being built in person is very important. Once you feel a person's vibe, once you know them, then it's a lot easier to work remotely because quite often, you know, I, I still have a massive gripe with the video calling. I think it's like 65, 70% there, but 30% of the time, something or the other is wrong. And so then you end up on a conversation with a black screen, which is the worst, <laughs> especially for people who've just joined the company. Yeah. And so I think, some offline touch points are very important on a regular basis. So people actually meet people, but you know, a remote first is, is how we're sort of uh, thinking about this. Um, so these interactions that you talk about, um, my, my next question uh, sort of is linked to that. Um, want to get a sense from you, Kavin, um, on how to build trust within a company at a time when 
you know, hiring, joining, work, everything is happening online. Uh, what are some of the things that you are doing at Hike? Um, so we just, you know, as as our, so we we have something called the the Hike management system. We actually haven't talked about this openly, but maybe it's not a bad time to talk about this. Which is, we've designed a system to keep ourselves accountable. We've designed a system to ensure that we're incredibly transparent as a company. And we've designed our system in a way where there's continuous coaching and feedback happening all the time. So people know what, what's expected of them. And I feel like that's really um, transformed our culture and the way we do things where there's so much clarity at the business level and also clarity of what's expected from a skills perspective and a values perspective from each and every single employee. Once you have that tremendous amount of clarity, most issues get resolved because clarity or lack of clarity is the biggest issue that people actually have. What is expected of me? What am I supposed to do? And if you build systems to ensure that we have a tremendous amount of clarity, which by the way is tough because on a daily basis in a fast moving company, things are changing all the time. It makes things a lot easier. Second is we actually have a proper like onboarding process designed that we flipped to remote last year. It is a, um, you know, two week onboarding process. So for the first week, you know, people come in and we're just getting them up to speed on the company, the systems, how we do feedback, how we do performance, what do we mean by OKRs, what our goals look like, what are our values, how does perform, everything, the whole system. So they're fully plugged in and they know what to expect. And we also ensure that they're meeting three or four key people and building relationships with them in the first week itself, people they'll, they'll touch base with the most. And these are things we used to do offline, but we sort of brought them online and we've used tools to bring all this stuff online. And honestly, I think it's working pretty well. And so our systems of accountability, transparency, coaching and feedback and our strong onboarding builds an environment where people can sort of become a hiker as fast as possible. And that's very, very important because if a company is a you know, community of people, people must belong, feel like they belong in a community as quickly as possible. And like with everything, this is going to improve. We're going to learn from everything we do. And, you know, by, if you talk to me at the end of the year, I'm sure I'll tell you three more things we're doing and two things we stopped doing. And so that's just a natural process of how we do things. Um, Kavin, you, you spoke about, you know, letting people take as much time as they need to uh, because things are really tough out there. But at the end of the day, leaders are just as human as anyone else. And in these times, they would feel just as vulnerable and anxious. How can one find some peace and calm amidst balancing personal anxieties and those of the team? Yeah, it's a good question. Actually, it's a great question. It's actually one of my favorite questions, but I feel like it's, it's less about trying to find peace. It's about how are you able to keep your calm through the fire that is burning? And because if you're building a company and if you're building something new and innovating, you know, fires are burning all the time. That's what you live for half the time because it's new, it's different. There's so much risk, there's so much uncertainty and this just adds to the situation, right? So how do you through all that stuff stay calm? And I think the first thing is you just got to believe that life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. I feel like most people have the opposite view of life. And you know, people need to know they have a choice, you know, no matter how difficult the situation is. And you're not really imprisoned by your circumstances, you are freed by your choices. So people need to have a different mindset, I feel. And second is once you have that mentality, you start taking radical responsibility. If life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react to it, then wait, 90% of your life is in your control. So you start taking radical responsibility and you rely on yourself and you take ownership of then bringing people together and solving problems, no matter what the odds. It's like a principle, it's like a principle of life. If life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react to it, then what you do has the biggest impact on life. Third is, I feel like to also get to this mentality, you have to build a lifestyle of high energy, um, especially for leaders. Energy is it. It's the first principle of doing anything meaningful and great in life. And once you have ample amounts of energy, you have the space in yourself to be self-aware. You're not caught up on every reaction. You're not caught up in every emotion. There's some space between you and your mind. And that's very, very important. Then I feel like fourth, to get there, to build a, to have a lifestyle of high energy, you have to have a certain mastery over the human form. 
you have to have a certain mastery over the body you have to have a certain mastery over the mind and the ego and so on and to do that you got to understand you know what the human form is and the human form honestly for the most part the human experience is based in chemistry we're just a bunch of chemicals that are you know acting a certain way and it has a big influence on our moods and how we think and so on and so forth and that's why i invest so much of my like i i invest a decent amount of time making sure that i build habits of high energy which is why i talk about my meditation it's important to move in some form every day you know the right diet both for the body and for the mind and just get enough sleep no one's saying get 8 9 hours of sleep get at least 6 7 hours of good sleep you know to sort of uh, you know get to that place and these things don't take more than an hour hour and a half every day you know if you're up if you're sleeping 7 hours a day and you're you're up 17 hours you can take an hour hour and a half out of your day and still work 16 hours a day no problem right and last the bonus is find time for solitude and quiet which is very tough to do in the modern world there's so many distractions you know in your if you if you got an hour or something in your time people just go and turn on netflix you know and so find some time for quiet and solitude because that's the best way to get to know yourself and i think if you do all of these things or even portions of them you end up building a high energy lifestyle if you build a high energy lifestyle then you sort of start taking radical responsibility because you believe wait you have that capacity to be self aware and take responsibility for your life and your and your decisions and that then it becomes very easy to stay calm no matter what the situation is because everything is in your control and i feel like that's the right mindset to have for anybody especially leaders during this time wonderful interesting that you mentioned that take an hour off if need be during the day reminds me of the swedes who have that 4 pm break if i'm not wrong they do the swedish pika where they have something sweet and yeah. have a coffee and maybe take a nap also so i don't know if it's going to happen in india but uh, it's an interesting well, you know people have to i feel like there's no one way of doing it like for me it's like before i start my day i have an hour and a half to myself everything gets done there right and then i go after my day so and some people actually do it in the evening some people do it at night so i feel like whatever kind of sort of works for you got to figure it out right hike has gone remote first completely remote obviously right now um i'd like your thoughts on the future of work and the flexible hybrid model of working that you know many tech behemoths including google seem to have adopted um it's obviously work from home for now but in the future what's it going to be like for hike employees as the very idea of physical offices are sort of reimagined yeah you know it's a it's a good question it's actually a great question and to start off with hike is officially a remote first company and we've been like this since march last year and what that means is you can work from honestly anywhere in the world as long as two criteria are met one is whatever you are you have to have a very fast internet connection that's a non negotiable and second is you know most likely you're in india but if you're outside of the indian time zone you have to work on ist that's very very important it's the time zone we all work around if do if those two criteria are met no problem if they are not you have to get yourself to a place where you have a fast internet connection and you can work around this time zone so and what we've done and until recently is complement the remote first approach we were complementing it with some we work spaces in gurgaon so teams can come together and meet people new employees can sort of build chemistry um especially if they're new because i think that's a very important piece of the puzzle and i think when when sort of things settle down with this wave of covid you'll see us again go back to complementing a remote first style within person working and um we, for example all our planning happens in person some more important meetings every two weeks will happen in person just to ensure that we're touching base with people on a physical basis because i feel like that connection is very important uh i feel like also we're going to see a variety of methods every company will figure out what works best for them and i imagine we'll have a tremendous amount of different versions some people are fully remote some people are remote first you know uh some people will be 3 4 days you know in person 2 3 days remote some some companies will be the opposite and i feel like this is also a big experiment on remote working for everybody including us and it's possible over time we will land up somewhere in the middle of all this stuff but we are definitely remote first right now with complements in the in the offline world I also think that um video calling also is very antiquated you know this uh it's a it's a decade old technology now and you know it's just that bandwidth's gotten better and we've got some companies like zoom optimizing compression really well 
And this is a space that's going to be ripe for disruption on both the hardware and the software side. And I can't wait to see new tech companies build in this space. Uh, and I feel like, um, you know, given we've had so much rapid evolution of these devices, suddenly like it's very cheap to build new hardware that can go and transform video calling completely. And the dream state for everybody, of course, is, you know, um, sitting on a table and, and, and talking to people remotely, but it feels like they're all sort of right next to you. And I have no doubt that in the next five years, even possibly sooner, there will be some companies working on this. And I think once that happens, that's also going to be a game changer because look, you know, you're, you're getting to a place where you have like companies like OneWeb and, you know, SpaceX Starlink that are now putting internet in space, which means that if you have like a hundred megabits per second coming from space, you can literally work from anywhere. And then all you got to do is if you're plugged in, have that feeling of people around you. And so I feel like that's also a space that's going to be disrupted. And I think again, as that gets disrupted, that adds to what kind of remote culture you have. So I think it's going to be quickly evolving the next three, four, five years, especially as technology evolves. Right. So Hayek's future is definitely going to be flexible and hybrid. Can we go with that? Yeah. So we are remote first. And remote, not fully remote, but remote first, which means our default is remote. And we complement the remote first with offline spaces, of course, in, in normal times, not times like this. So we are remote first and remote first means with some complement in the offline world. Even in a post-pandemic world order. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So um, before we wrap up, Kavin, um, you've, of course, started your own vaccination drive for employees and their families, as have several other companies. Um, experts say vaccination is the only way out of this mess that we find ourselves in uh, right now. So now that uh, this is underway, I wanted to get your thoughts on when do you hope to see some green shoots in the economy um, in terms of growth, jobs, etc.? Yeah, it's a, you know, it's a, it's an important question, honestly. And I think um, the nation's priority, priority right now is, of course, safeguarding lives, solving for medical, medical infrastructure, and so on and so forth. But, you know, just looking at the last decade um, of my own sort of life and experience and just studying decades before, it seems like, you know, time is not linear. Time is cyclical. Everything tends to happen in, in cycles. In, in sort of these positive and constructive cycles. And so we're sort of in a tough spot right now. We're in a sort of constructive cycle right now, but I have no doubt that this is just a phase and we get back to more of a positive phase in the cycle sooner than later. And so it's, it's def things are definitely cyclical. And the last thing I'd say is, despite all this stuff, the tech sector is booming, you know, in terms of so much funding coming in and as a result, so many jobs being created and you know, and, and so much more, which is a great sign. And maybe this is again, a, a good learning point for us to pick up and say, how do we get sort of the local tech internet sector to contribute to a larger part of the GDP, which is also a great strategy for any a long term strategy for any country. And so I feel like there are definitely parts of the economy that are booming and doing extremely well. The question is, how can we get sort of everything else, you know, closer to sort of where we are in the tech space. And just coming back to the, the point about vaccination, we need to get to a place where you know, um, lockdowns sort of open up, all these things do open up as quickly as they can because there's a huge offline economy as well that's getting significantly impacted by this. As a matter of fact, it's weird. You know, the, the online economy actually is booming as a result <laughs> because people are spending more time at home and online, but the offline economy actually is taking a big, big uh, hit. And I think, I think as soon as we open up and people are vaccinated and, you know, things will get back to normal and uh, we get back on a path to recovery. Right. Um there's also this school of thought, you know, from uh, the industries that are perhaps the worst affected, travel, hospitality, etc. Um, they believe in something called revenge travel and sort of revenge eating out, etc. Like people have been locked up for so long now that once things do get okay, uh, they're not going to take their lives for granted anymore. They're going to want to sort of live it like there was no tomorrow. So... Uh, if that happens, then of course the economy is going to bounce back and there's going to be growth and everything. Uh, but Kavin, uh, always a pleasure talking to you. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time out. Uh, as always, pleasure chatting with you. 
Thanks. Thanks for having me. It was great.